Takari Miboto has meanwhile called for the rehabilitation of the National Union. In the end, the government tolerated the meeting, but only inside party buildings. The Interior Ministry is downplaying declarations from the opponent and suggested a commission be created to assess the state of his health. If it is later proven that he is not in possession of all his mental and physical capacities, I will ask him to step down. Following years of political repression, the party in power is now trying to discredit its opponent, Andre Emba Obame, former heavyweight of the regime who switched sides following the death of Omar Bongo. American astronaut Neil Armstrong has died at the age of 82. Armstrong, who was the first man to walk on the moon, was also a reluctant hero, never trading on his fame or popularity. For observers of the U.S. space pole program, Armstrong was forever the astronaut who had all the stuff. CNN's John Zarela looks back at Armstrong's life and career. Ohio in 1930, when air travel was still in its infancy, and space travel was the stuff of science fiction. But Armstrong says he had the same dream over and over again. He was hovering above the ground by holding his breath. Armstrong took his first airplane ride when a Ford Trimotor, a plane called the Tin Goose, came to the local airfield. The bug had taken hold. As a teenager, he began taking flying lessons even before getting his driver's license. Armstrong pursued his passion and earned a degree in aeronautical engineering. He joined the military during the Korean War and flew 78 combat missions in Navy Panther jets. Later, Armstrong became a test pilot for the X-15, the rocket plane that laid the groundwork for space travel. It was some ride, soaring an amazing 40 miles above the Earth at 4,000 miles an hour. And then, in 1961, during the height of the Cold War, in the midst of the space race with the Soviet Union, President John Kennedy made a dramatic challenge. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal, before this decade is out, of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. The next year, Armstrong joined the enormous undertaking and became an astronaut. Four years later, he made his first journey into space as commander of the Gemini 8 mission, which nearly ended in disaster. Armstrong kept his cool and brought the spacecraft home safely after a thruster rocket malfunction. The next trip to space was on July 16, 1969. He and astronauts Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins blasted off in Apollo 11. On a journey of nearly 250,000 miles, a journey into history, it took them four days to reach their destination. The world watched and waited as the lunar module, Eagle, separated from the command module and began its descent. Then came the words from Armstrong. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. About six and a half hours later, at 10.56 p.m. Eastern Time on July 20th, 1969, Neil Armstrong became the first person to set foot on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. He was followed by Aldrin. Armstrong was on the surface for two hours and 32 minutes, Aldrin just 15 minutes less. The two astronauts staked an American flag, scooped up moon rocks, and set up scientific experiments before returning to the main spacecraft. The three crewmates returned home to a hero's welcome, though none of them ever returned to space. Armstrong, seen on the left, was 38 when he made his historic landing. The first man on the moon left the astronaut corps the next year and taught engineering at the University of Cincinnati. He once joked, quote, I am and ever will be a White Sox pocket protector, nerdy engineer. He was, of course, much, much more than that. He was also a husband and father of two, and a man who left his footprint forever on the U.S. space program. John Zarella, CNN, reporting. Haiti is trying to clean up after Tropical Storm Isaac pounded the impoverished island nation, causing heavy rains and flooding which claimed two lives. The country is still struggling to recover from a devastating earthquake in 2010. 
Thousands of people still live in tent cities. Part of the South East bore the brunt of Isaac, including the city of Jackmel, from where CNN's Martin Savage reports. The road to Jacmel isn't easy. We're only 200 yards away from the house where we spent the night, and this is exactly what we were afraid of. Trees that have come down, and big, heavy trees here, all the way on this road down to Jacmel. We're trying to get there, but without a chainsaw, this is really going to be an extremely difficult job. A machete is Haiti's answer to the problem, and almost everybody seems to have one. The trees that block the road have also pulled down telephone and power lines. We clear one obstacle, only to find more lie ahead. So he's saying that... There's street on the way. So down the street, it's still yeah. blocked again. Yeah. Water is an even greater danger, threatening to rise faster than it can run off. You can see the water is uh, coming down through this uh, cut. And what they want to make sure is that you don't get any debris, the branches, the tree limbs, things like that. Because if they were to clog in any way, then you've got a real problem of flooding in the community. So this makes perfectly good sense. When it comes to cleaning up, Haitians just get on with it. So do we when we find another tree in the way. Maybe around the edge? <laughs> then comes the flooding. Soon, it gets worse. This is what was feared, and this is exactly what's happening. The water rushing down off the hills finds its own channel, makes its own way. In this case, it just happens to be right through a neighborhood. Some are able to struggle through the current. Others need a helping hand. Eventually, we're on the road again and make our way to Jacmel, where ironically the power may be out, but the city's traffic light is still functioning. We find our way to the town's two evacuation shelters. So we're just going to have a look inside to see the conditions where people spent the night. You can see the conditions here are pretty uh, miserable at best. I mean, there's no electricity. The only thing they can say they have is a shelter over their head. At least they're semi-dry. <laughs> Haitian Boy Scouts look after the evacuees, but they have little to offer. The water isn't safe to drink. And what about food? There is no food. There is food at the next shelter, two plastic buckets of peanut butter and jelly to feed close to 1,000 people. Misery is about the only thing there's plenty of. Two and a half years ago, Jamel Peter lost her home to the earthquake. Since then, she's been renting a house. Last night, Isaac took that too. When I ask what she'll do next, she tells me simply, she's waiting for the government and God. And on that, she's not alone. Martin Savage, CNN, Jacques Mel, Haiti. Over now to news and sports. The Ministry of Youth and Sports has organized a 10-day summer camp in a bid to scale up mass participation in sports through education and grassroots sports. Mamadou S. Jalo witnessed the opening of the program that attracted 125 young people from all regions of the country, and this is his report. This summertime in the Gambia, schools have closed, and school children are taking a break from the bustle of daily school life to spend time with their families friends and loved ones. Others would prefer spending part of their holidays and join themselves in various ways, from visiting relatives at new places to partying on the beach or going out to watch a Navitan football match. Well, another way to enjoy one's holiday is by attending a summer camp. That is exactly why these young boys and girls are gathered in this hall to start a 10-day summer camp organized by the Ministry of Youth and Sports. This Youth and Sports Summer Camp being the first of its kind, has been attended by 125 boys and girls from all regions of the country. The summer camp stemmed from the ministry's National Youth and Sports Policy and Action Plan blueprint and masterminded by the acting director of sports. The Ministry of Youth and Sport, as part of its 2010-2019 Youth and Sport Policies and Programs of Action to ensure excellence in sports through mass participation and to develop, equip and train youthful population who are the engine of our socio-economic growth as a country. To do this, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we need to catch them young. 
We need to catch them young. We need to catch them young. 